In this example, I will demonstrate how to plan a FFLS observation. The tutorial will cover observing time estimates and how to specify those observing details which are required during phase 1 of the SOFIA proposal process in USPOT. USPOT is a SOFIA proposal tool which you will need to submit your proposal and their observing details. As target for this exercise is selected the Galaxy M82. The proposal is to observe the C plus line in the central area of M82. Always start your observing planning with getting flux estimates. State your sources or assumptions for your flux estimates clearly in the technical feasibility section in your proposal. You can, for example, get expected fluxes from KAO, ISO, or Herschel observations for the fire infrared where FIFLS is observing. Here in this example, uh, there is a paper by Contorsi et al., which observed the central part of M82. And here in figure 2, we see the central part of uh, M82 in the C plus line at 158 micron. Here I reproduced it on the slide and you can see here in the outskirts you get 2 times 10 to the minus 17 watt per square meter per spaxel, per spatial pixel of PAX. Now the PAX spatial pixel is 9.7 arc seconds on the side. However, the 50 less reg pixel is 12 arc seconds on the side. That means it's 1.5 times larger in area. So the expected flux per 50 less pixel is 3 times 10 to the minus 17 watt per square meters. Further information about the line uh, that you can get from the paper is here. Line widths can extend in the supergalactic wind in M82 up to 400 kilometers per second. Further, the center of the line shifts because of the galactic rotation and the wind of about 250 kilometers per second. Now, with these numbers, we can start our time estimate. You use SITE, the SOFIA Integration Time Estimator, here on our DCS website which defaults to forecast, but let's switch that page to FIFLS. Now let's have a look what we need to enter. Obviously we need to enter the wavelength. The, C, the wavelength of the C plus line is already here as default because that's a very popular line for FIFLS. We need to enter the bandwidth. Bandwidth in this case means width of the spectrum that you want to observe. So to make a decision how wide that needs to be, compare first the expected line width to the spectral resolution. The spectral resolution can be looked up here in the handbook. Make sure that you, that you get to the cycle 8 handbook. Here this table has uh, various numbers including the uh, resolution for most prominent lines, uh, but you also have here these uh, plots where you can read off the numbers for any wavelength. The spectral resolution of FFLS at the C plus line is 260 km per second. Compare that with the 400 km per second we can expect in the wind, we see that the line will be very barely resolved. In some areas where the line is not so broad, it's probably not resolved at all. Now, the other thing we need to look at, how wide will the spectrum be? The instantaneous spectral coverage is the minimum width of the spectrum that you will get. And that is what you get if you set zero as the bandwidth. For C+, that's 1560 kilometers per second. How does that compare with all the other values that we have? There is the line width at 400 kilometers per second. It will shift around 250 kilometers per second. So that's all kind of the maximum values that we expect. And we need on both sides of the uh, line kind of place in the spectrum where to estimate the baseline or the continuum level. So we're assuming here kind of twice the, uh, the line width 
adding that all up, we come to 1450 kilometers per second, which is less than the instantaneous spectral coverage, so we don't need to do anything uh, to request a broader spectrum than we would get anyway. Um, and now let's put all this into the time estimate. We have here time estimator, FFLS, uh, the wavelength is already set to uh, the wavelength of C+, 157.741 micron. The bandwidth, as we just discussed, can be left at zero because the instantaneous coverage is sufficient. The observer velocity, in most cases, can be ignored. Uh, we'll come to that later. That is basically the very centric velocity of the Earth that shifts the line by about 30 kilometers per second. Now, we want to in, uh, the total integration time to achieve a certain signal-to-noise ratio. Here, we leave it at 5. In your feasibility section, explain why you choose a certain signal-to-noise ratio uh, and relate that to your also your target flux. So, we said that we expect 3 times 10 to the minus 17 watt per square meter as total line intensity in the outskirts of the map and we want to detect that reasonably well so a signal to noise ratio of 5. And down here you have observation constraints like the elevation angle of your source and altitude and linked with that the default water vapor. Leave that at the default values to get a representative time estimate. And now, here just in the script, these are the numbers. Oh, yeah, forgot here. Source velocity. Of course, M82 is moving. You can look up in NED that it's moving at 23 kilometers per second away from us. So let's enter this. Good that I checked my script, and now we have everything. Um, default observing conditions, and now we can hit the Calculate button. And this is what you get. The most important number here is of course the integration time, and you see that here. Um, there are two values, smooth and unsmoothed. I come back to that in a minute. Now let look here, let's look at the plot of atmospheric transmission here. Um, wavelength and transmission uh, as calculated by the ATRAN model. The green line tells you where you should expect the line. Uh, that is the, uh, the entered wavelength plus all the velocities, observer velocity and source velocity. Um, then in blue you have the atmospheric transmission as calculated by ATRAN at full resolution. So all the photons coming from the sky will see this kind of transmission. Um, then the magenta line is the transmission convolved with the instrument uh, spectral resolution. So a continuum source, a uh, flat continuum source for example, uh, will be absorbed like this, but since the spectral resolution of FIFLS is limited, you will see the absorption features smoothed out, and so the continuum will have the shape of this magenta line. The red lines give you the width of the spectrum, either that is the instantaneous wavelength coverage, if your bandwidth requested one uh, is smaller than that, or the actual requested value. So, and now the, uh, in the integration time has to take the atmospheric transmission into account, and so that's where it can, these two values come from, either from the unsmoothed or the smoothed atmospheric transmission. Um, if they are separate, you get a, they are widely different, you get a warning, because then you are close to a line, and so you should pay attention um, to what you're doing if that is the atmospheric absorption uh, making the observation difficult and how to deal with that. You can always send us an email to the help desk to help you with these kind of questions. The rest of the numbers are mainly repeating the input values and uh, values used in the calculation. So now the result is basically we need a bit over 15 minutes, let's say 16 minutes integration time to observe 
this uh, line of 3 10 to the minus 17 watt per square meters. This is the total line flux, uh, and you detect that in this time at a signal to noise of 5. Um, that is when you have either this line unresolved, or if it should be resolved, which we saw might be barely, you need to kind of bin the spectrum so that uh, you have the total line flux in one spectral element. Then you have it at a signal to noise of 5. Now, the result was uh, 16 minutes on source integration time. I just want to also say here's again the uh, plot of the transmission. If you would increase the spectral width to 200 kilometers per second, just because you have more baseline or some other reason, the time would increase to 20 minutes. So not that uh, large increase. And now, how do we enter that into the AORs? So let's have a look at the AOR first. Let me start U-Spot. It comes up here with the, so to speak, proposal title page. We don't want to look at that now. Uh, pretty transparent what you have to fill in here. Let's switch to the observations where you add then an AOR. And of course, here we want to have a 50 LS AOR. Uh, note that you all only need to fill in the fields where there is a red star. All the other fields will be filled in during phase two in collaboration with the instrument scientist. Now, give it a nice title here, a label, M82C+, and the target will be M82. You can use Simpad or NAT to resolve it. Make sure that the resolve, uh, resolving works and Simpad or NAT give you the coordinate that you want. You can also manually enter the coordinates here. Now, um, FIFI-LS has two channels which operate simultaneously. We want to have the C plus line in the red channel. That's already filled in because the C plus line here is the default. Let's switch because uh, PAX didn't typically observe that line. The 52 micron line uh, for, of O3, that is at 51.815. Um, Width of the spectrum, we checked for the Z plus line that the instantaneous wavelength coverage is sufficient, so we just leave it at that. Uh, you don't need to fill in the width of the spectral feature, this is just information for the instrument scientists, so it's good to have. Um, let me do this here. The source velocity is 203 km per second, we know that from NED. Now, the on source exposure time. Um, is 30 seconds per cycle. Leave that at the default value typically and you kind of now can increase this with the cycles. But before I go on I need to explain a little bit more about the mapping and the overlaps of the field of views. For that let me create this AOR and to visualize the observation let me get in DSS image of the source, make it a bit larger, half a degree, and have it download for you. So here is our galaxy. Um, maybe a log scale makes it a bit nicer uh, with all the values. Okay, and now let me overplot the AOR that we just created. This is possible with uh, this button here or in the overlay menu with overlay current AOR. And there it is. Um, the blue square is the field of view of the blue array and the red square is the field of view of the red array. They're not quite concentric. This is the real shift between the two. And in green and purple you have the 
chopping beams as they are currently set up with their default values. Now we want to map a larger area so we need to step the field of view around. Um, we want to have a fully covered 52 micron map so we need to step by 30 arc seconds since this is 30 arc seconds on the side and the red field is one arc minute on the side. When we do that we get an overlay uh, or several exposures by the red array as we are stepping the blue array. Let me demonstrate that by adding here a 3x3 three three grid with 30 arc seconds uh, safe stepping. The number of the grid numbers is important because it enters the exposure time calculation. The details for the steps here can be adjusted later. Um, and yeah, typical grid map. Now apply, and now we have uh, I need to move this away because this always stays on top. And now you see here we have a nicely tiled 3x3 three three coverage of the blue array. That means the red array. Let me get this out of the way so that we can actually get to a nice animation feature that tells you how the observation is done, kind of in sequence. The blue array and then the next red array kind of has an overlap. And here's another overlap and another overlap with the previous ones. So in the center part, we will in the end, in the end have four times coverage by a red array. So where we said we need 16 minutes, but for each pointing, we need just a quarter of that to cover the central part with 16 minutes. I have that written down here. Considering the overlap with the different sizes, we get a four time overlap for the red array in the center. So we actually need only 16 divided by four minutes. So four minutes per raster point on the C plus, on, uh, for C plus on source. Now we have a 30 seconds on source time per cycle. Thus we need 8 cycles to get 4 minutes per raster points. And now let me enter this in the AOR here. 8 cycles, 3x3 three three grid, and apply that. And here you can check the observing time. You get 2000, uh, about 2,000 seconds on source for the whole map. With overheads here, you get up to uh, you get 5,700 seconds, 5,800 seconds almost, um, as total observing time. And yeah, that's what I uh, repeated here. Now, of course, in on the edges with that three by three grid, 30 arc seconds stepping, you get the one arc minute in the center with full coverage, 16 minutes. You have four fields on the sides, sized one arc minute by 30 arc seconds, with an eight minute depth, integration depth, and the corners, the 30 arc seconds corners, only get four arc minutes, and the signal to noise in this area will be six, uh, accordingly less. The larger map you have, the smaller these edge effects are. Now, this mapping strategy can be slightly increased, uh, made more efficient with dither, um, these details go in phase two, but the main numbers for the main uh, integration time, this is what we just covered here, and the whole thing takes 96 minutes. Now let's have another look here. Of course, the offset positions here, the, where we chop and nod, is not ideal. Um, but these are details that get fixed in phase two. But what you need to do here is make sure that the observing strategy with chop and knot is possible. That you find for the chop and knot, now let me get the AOR back up again so that we can play around with these values. And now obviously, we need to move the chop positions further out 
and out of the galaxy. So let's try four arc minutes and the chop angle of position angle of minus 20, apply, and there you see it, we are well above the, the galaxy outside of the plane. Um, the nice option here with FIFLS is also that FIFLS has a beam rotator, so we can actually choose the array angle. So, except, I mean, the other instruments, the array angle is here is just to visualize different options that you may get, but you can't control it. With FIFLS and GRADE, you can actually control the orientation of the footprint on the sky. I want to orient it along the galaxy like this. And um, yeah, this looks reasonable. As I said, the details of the mapping strategy, adding a dither for example, and the exact details how to chop a nod uh, will be done in phase two. But just make sure that you have a way forward using the symmetric chop and you don't need, for example, the asymmetric chop because you have a very large source and you need to have larger chopping, uh, chop throw. So this is basically the whole setup we have to do for the AOR. Just one thing remains to be checked. We selected the 52 micron line in the blue channel. Now what kind of sensitivity can we can ex expect, expect there? Uh, we need to use site for that. So let's type in here the wavelength. Bandwidth, the velocity stays the same. We just want to switch here to calculate the signal to noise for a certain time. And we have now per position the blue array since there is no overlap, four minutes or 240 seconds. Just leave the source flux there. Then we get to know what this kind of source flux, the three times 10 to the minus 17 watt per square meter, what signal to noise will that give us in four minutes, calculating it, it gives us a signal to noise of about 1.1. And down here you see the atmospheric transition transmission. I have that also here on my last slide. Yeah, we get in the blue channel four minutes per point and site estimates for us that we get basically a one sigma noise level of three times the minus 17 uh, watt per square meters per FIFLS Spaxel. Note there is at where we expect the line a small absorption feature that's small enough to be ignored. It's just a slight increase in uncertainty of how your line interacts with this small feature and therefore you lose how much flux. There is however a large absorption feature on to one side of the spectrum so if you would have a high continuum you have, well, at the line, kind of somewhat a slope coming from that feature, but to the edge of the spectrum, it basically becomes unusable because you don't have any transmission there anymore. And you should expect kind of noise in that area. With the instrument scientist, you can discuss if you want to shift the window a bit to the side so that you have more baseline on one side than on the other side, but you still want to have a nice coverage of that bonus line here.